topic this afternoon is entitled A Creationist View of Speciation and Change in Species. It could be uh, retitled A Creationist Version of Evolution, I suppose, but uh, we avoid the term evolution because it means different things to different people. And so we are going to talk about the process of change, looking at evolutionary theory and in evaluating if there are parts of evolutionary theory that actually fit in with a creationist viewpoint and try to develop a creationist view of how life has changed since the creation. We'll look at four topics. First, we'll look at what the Bible has to say about the origins of species and about changes that have occurred since the creation. Secondly, we'll take a look at some of the things that science has revealed or discovered about how species change. And then by that time, we'll have enough information to at least outline a theory of how a creationist might view this situation. And then we'll have some conclusions. First of all, what does the Bible have to say? about the origins of species. Well, on the third day of creation, the text indicates that plants were created and different categories of plants are identified. The point that I am drawing from this is that during the third day of creation, God created a diversity of plants more than one kind of plant. In other words, not simply some ancestral plant from which all others have evolved, but that at the very beginning, there are different kinds of plants. One of the interesting types that is mentioned is fruit trees, trees bearing fruit. Notice that at least in the text here, it's plural. I don't think the text is saying God created one plant that produced fruit, but many kinds of plants producing fruit. Likewise with plants yielding seed. Then on the fifth day, God goes to fill the seas let the water be filled with many kinds of living beings. And then it names some different kinds of living beings that were created on the fifth day. Not an ancestor to everything else, but many different kinds to begin with. I have illustrated what that could mean with some photographs of different kinds of organisms, very different kinds. Arthropods and mollusks are very different in their body structure, and both are very different from vertebrates, such as fish and whales, and so on with uh, echinoderms and others. So I think what the Bible is telling us that relates to our topic of today is that there was diversity to begin with. And you will see the word polyphyly in the title, Polyphyly is a term meaning many separate origins. The contrasting term where everything is coming from one ancestor is monophyly. Evolutionary biologists talk about monophyly or monophyletic groups. The implication there is that they have a single ancestor in common. This is not what scripture, the picture that's given in scripture, that there were many kinds of living beings that were created all together in one day. In fact, the sea is not the only habitat that was filled. Also on day five, God said, let the air be filled with flying creatures. Now, it's, the term is translated as birds, but I understand from experts like Dr. Yonker uh, that the actual term means flyers, and that could include not only birds, but also bats. And uh, I've not seen it discussed, but I, don't, I wonder sometimes if it could include flying insects. I do not know. 
but at least there was diversity. So God created all kinds of birds. And there you see some varieties. And on the top left diagram, you'll actually see bats uh, hanging in the tree in Australia. Then on day six, let the earth bring forth living creatures, plural, according to their kinds, plural. And then some categories mentioned, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth. So in the creation, there is diversity from the very beginning. There's polyphyly in the sea, polyphyly in the creatures of the air, and polyphyly in the creatures of the land. Notice that when God creates, he doesn't create in a taxonomic sequence. In other words, he doesn't create mammals, reptiles, fish, echinoderms, mollusks, brachiopods, no. He fills the habitats First, the sea habitat, then the flying, ha the aerial habitat, and finally, the land habitat. I like to think that God is an ecologist because he is working in habitat terms. And of course, as a person who appreciates nature a great deal and natural things, I have a very, uh, a sympathetic reaction to God as an ecologist. I like that thought. Finally, humans in God's image. Notice again that humans were created individually. Whereas on day six, when God creates the land animals, he just says, let the earth bring forth lots of different things. Now, in his mind, I'm sure he had specific things in mind. But as far as the text is concerned, he just says, let the land be full of creatures. But when it comes to humans, he takes one individual, Adam. He creates Adam as an individual, not even Eve at the same time. Then later, he creates Eve as an individual, not a whole bunch of women, one, and I think there's significance in that, that each one of us, each human being, is an individual in God's sight, given the image of God and responsibility and care. There is a difference in the way humans are pictured in scripture from the way the rest of the world is created. And to me, that, that gives me a sense that God is a personal friend and re regards me not just as one of a species, but as an individual and a special individual. Now, the Bible also talks about changes that were to come into the creation. Some creationists have supposed that species would not change, but the Bible does not teach that. Think of the serpent. God said the serpent is cursed more than all the rest of the animals. I kind of think it implies the rest of the animals may have had some of a curse too, but serpents especially. The serpent would crawl on its belly. Then he said there will be thorns and thistles something would happen not only to the animals, but also to the plants. The plants would somehow be changed and unpleasant changes were to result. Another thing that came in is death. We're told that there was no death, there was no violence, there was no predation, just um, plants were provided for the creatures, but because of sin, death came in. Death makes quite a bit of difference. Think of our ecology today. How would the ecological relationships be changed if there were no death? Have you thought about that? If there were no death, we would have to stop 
reproducing, wouldn't we? Because otherwise the world would be soon overcome with individuals. Can you think of a world with neither reproduction nor death? It's, it's not anything we've ever experienced. I suspect the original ecology was quite different from what we have today, and perhaps difficult to, to reconstruct, but we are told a similar kind of ecology will result in the, in the new creation, where the lion eats straw like the ox, they will neither hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, that things will be different. Humans will not marry, but be as the angels. So something to look forward to is something different, but certainly something very blessed. No violence in the original creation, but violence came in. I don't think anyone has ever painted a picture of the Garden of Eden in which any of these examples are included. Have you ever seen a picture of the Garden of Eden with lions killing a buffalo? I have not, and I don't expect I ever will. There's a difference between Eden and now. And another term that the scripture uses in Genesis 6 is that all flesh had corrupted its way. Exactly what that means, I do not know, but it does seem to indicate that there had been changes and that they were in a negative direction. They were corruption of the original good creation. Finally, diet. Diet, of course, may or may not be associated with changes in structure, but it certainly is associated with changes in behavior. So the animal, not only the animal kingdoms changed in its structure, such as the snake the serpent losing its ability to walk, it also changed in behavior, in, in its choice of foods and so on. Now, many Christians have looked in Genesis chapter one and in the story of the flood and in the Leviticus 11 where the clean and unclean animals are described and listed and the expression according to their kinds, I'm using English, I'm not sure what it would be in other languages, but according to their kinds, after their kinds, is, that expression is used. And they have supposed that that means that there was no change. They were fixed according to their kinds. Some have even argued that if God created things perfectly, then they would not need to change. And if you are suggesting that animals have changed, then you are implying that God didn't do a very good job of creating because the animals and plants that he created were, weren't able to survive in the, and had to change. And sometimes you've seen that, that as an idea, especially a few hundred years ago. And so this biblical phrase after their kinds has been used to support the idea that species do not change. And we need to deal with this concept. The real source of that concept of fixity of species is from Neoplatonic philosophy, where Plato proposed a dualism between ideas and matter. And for example, you might think of a horse. In the mind of God, there is some kind of perfect horse. And ideas are perfect. But when you come to put that idea into material form, it's an imperfect copy of the idea. So every horse is like the ideal, imperfect, and there may be some variation in some de uh, uh, details. But to think that that horse could actually change into something that we would call, for example, a zebra, which is really a kind of horse, uh, that might be too much. So the, at one time, the scholars believed that species could not be fixed, uh, sorry, that were fixed, but could not change, and that scripture supported that idea. But this is an example of taking an idea from 
the common philosophical knowledge and importing it into the church, looking for a biblical text to support it, and then calling it a biblical idea. It's really not a biblical idea at all. The phrase, after their kinds, would probably be more clear if it was translated of various kinds or of many kinds. And in fact, it is written in some versions of the English Bible. Those are the words that are used of various kinds. And I, I list Good News Bible, New Living Translation, and the Message Bible. So, here are some important points from the biblical story of creation. And I, I added a fifth one after I put down four here. The first point is that life came about by creation. That, that's a fairly elementary point, but it's an important one. Life did not arise through some kind of chemical reactions out in some primordial soup. Life comes from a creator who is an amazingly technologically skillful and intelligent creator. Originally, in the creation, the second idea, the original creation was polyphyletic. That is, God created diversity from the very beginning. Diversity itself did not come about through evolutionary processes, but it started out, the whole situation started out with diverse creatures. A third important point is that humans are special, created individually, given the image of God, responsibility for the, for the creation, and a special relationship to the creator. A another important idea that comes out of these first three chapters of Genesis is that the curses, sin brought curses, that brought changes, Creature, animals and plants have changed since the creation. The Bible doesn't tell us how much they've changed or what all the details are, but we can, through our scientific uh, studies, we can at least propose some ideas on how that might work and how much it might be. A final point I didn't discuss earlier, but it's an important point that in this context. When the animals were being released from the ark and Noah and his family were coming out of the ark, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, if you think about animals coming out of an ark somewhere in Southwest Asia, and they're going to disperse across the whole planet, what do they need to be able to do in order to reach distant areas? Well, they need to be able to move, of course, but they also need to be able to survive the journey. And in the journey, they may encounter habitats that are different from the one where they started out. And in order to disperse and fill the whole world, there's going to need to be some kind of adaptability that a dog who is walking across Siberia into the New World, into North America, and then down into South America is going to have to be flexible. Now, I, I say a dog, let me say, be more specific. A population of dogs which is expanding its range and dispersing across strange habitats. Over time, will, new individuals will have to come in who have, can adapt to the new habitat. So at the present time, we have dogs, species of dogs, foxes and wolves and so on, that live in very cold climates, the Arctic fox being an example. We also have some that live in very hot climates, such as the fennec in the deserts of North Africa. And of course, even in our own California and Mexico, we have wild dogs, coyotes and gray foxes and so on, kit foxes. So in order for them to adapt to the local habitats, there must be some capacity for change. All right, now let's look at scientific aspects of change in species and see what does science tell us about change in species. First of all, we need to define what a species is. And there are many definitions of what a species is. I prefer this one. It's called the biological species concept. Uh, it isn't useful when studying fossils because we cannot tell 
whether fossils have the ability to interbreed or not. But in the living creatures, a biological species is a group of populations that can interbreed. There is gene flow from one population to another. If you have two populations, presumably located in different places, but if you have two populations of organisms that are identical in their appearance, but they are unable to exchange genes because they are reproductively incompatible, you have, by definition, two species, even though you cannot see any difference between them. If they cannot interbreed, they are, by definition, different species. That's what species means. Now, it appears to me that many of the originally created species have diversified into what we might call a lineage. A lineage is a group of species that have descended from a common ancestor. The common ancestor was created. Since the creation, changes have occurred, such as using the dog family as an example. In different areas, we have different, different kinds of dogs. And Japan has its own kind of dog. India has its own kind of dog. Uh, Australia has its own kind of dog. Africa has two or three uh, different kinds of dogs, and so on through across the world. That could all be considered to be a single lineage created separately in its ancestral form, but changing since that time. Now, how might that happen? According to our scientific understanding, populations can become isolated from each other geographically. Once they become isolated geographically, then they, they can begin to diverge. Within a population that, where there's constant interbreeding, any genetic change can easily pass through the population. And there's genetic change going on all the time. Populations are constantly changing in their genetic details, even though they may not look much different. So if you take two populations in different areas, the genetic changes that are going on in one population are not transferred to the other population because they're separate. So over time, the changes that happen in one group are different from the changes that happen in the other group. And eventually, a time arrives when, if there were to be a crossing from one population to the other, the genetic changes that have occurred independently may be incompatible. If so, then you have a reproductive barrier. They are now reproductively incompatible and are, by definition, different species. So we have an explanation of how this might happen. And the name for this process is speciation. And the principle here is that after separation comes divergence. Populations that are separate from each other will diverge from each other. We see that with human beings. Populations of humans that are on some remote island develop their own racial characteristics to some extent, or tribal characteristics. And we can see this in, uh, across the whole world. We see. Uh, of course, with modern transportation, the, the species is becoming more, more blended to some extent. But before we had modern transportation, we could be sure that when we went to different regions, with different languages especially, language is a powerful isolating mechanism. Uh, but in those conditions, we could be sure that people of different tribes would have some small difference in their appearance. And it's the same in the animal kingdom and in the plant kingdom. Now, we might review a little bit about how changes might occur. Consider this diagram here to represent, let's see, here it is, to represent a habitat and these shapes to represent individuals with, within the population individuals with slightly different genetics, just individual differences. And consider shapes like this. These are 
These shapes are filled, these shapes are empty. The empty shapes represent genetic combinations that are possible, but at that particular moment, there isn't any individual with that particular combination of genes. Someday there will be, but right at the moment, not, not every combination is expressed at any particular time. So in this population, we have a number of individuals. One is different perhaps than the others, but there are potentially more kinds. We do not see everything that's possible just by looking in a population. Now, in the next generation, it may be by chance some of those genetic combinations don't appear in the next gener generation. Or perhaps some of them do appear that weren't present before. So there's a little bit, every generation may be just a little bit different as the gene combinations shift back and forth. Not any great big change, but just individual differences. Now suppose we take a look at that population over time and, sudden, and at some point there begins to be a little change. And let's just say this represents a habitat that remains constant all the way through. But over here we have a new habitat, a habit, part of the habitat starts to change in its climate. Maybe it gets drier, maybe it gets hotter, whatever it may be. Maybe it has a different kind of plant growing there. There, be, there begins to be some kind of change. Well, at first, probably we won't see any real difference. But over time, we may notice that uh, some new kinds, some new gene combinations appeared. This, this fellow here hasn't been seen before because he didn't, perhaps he didn't survive very well under these conditions, but he can survive under these conditions. He's a little different genetically, and likewise through the others. And then in the next generation, uh, maybe uh, we have some shifting and so on, but then let's just suppose this represents an increase in the environmental difference. You see the color of the boundary is a little different here, and here it's a little stronger in its color. And so we're starting to develop a population here that is characteristic of this habitat, which is distinguished from the population here, which is characteristic of that habitat. And that process may continue on, and in a few generations, you may have separate species. If these individuals somehow develop, they're, they're, they're isolated by habitat from the others, and if they do not re, uh, reproduce or interbreed, then we may find that these are actually slightly different in their appearance. We have what you might call family traits or tribal traits that are developing. We're starting to get differences. And if that process continues, it's very possible that genetic changes may result in genetic incompatibility, and then we'll have different species. But that isn't inevitable, but it is possible. Selection is what's going on. Natural selection in this habitat is pulling the genetic combinations toward an optimum, whereas in this habitat, selection is pulling genetic combinations toward an optimum for that habitat. And since the habitats are different, the, the optimal genetic combinations will be different. So you get somewhat differences in the populations. So we have local adaptation to local habitats. Now, natural selection operates under these circumstances. The first requirement for natural selection is variation. Individuals must vary, and we know that that's the case. We vary in our height, weight, skin color, uh, voice tone, uh, eye color. We even vary in our preference for certain foods. We vary in our ability to digest certain foods. We even vary in how long it, how old it, we need to be in order to reproduce. There is variation even within humans in all these characteristics. So variation is ubiquitous. Since reproductive capacity is generally greater than the resources that are available. That means not every individual that is born can survive. 
Now in human society, we try to make provision for that, but the, the rats and mice don't do that. The, and the, the cockroaches and elephants, they don't do that. They, each mother, of course, of a, a of certain species tries to preserve their baby. But in general, there are more baby frogs produced than there is space for the frogs to live. So there's not enough resources. Therefore, some of the baby frogs are not going to live to reproduce. What determines which ones live and which ones die? Well, you could say in a word, strength. Uh, a more complete definition wouldn't be mere physical strength, but the ability, whether it's by strength or by instinct or by intelligence, the ability to obtain resources and convert them into offspring. So competition is an inherent part of natural selection. You don't have natural selection unless you have resource shortage. Then you have differential reproduction. Individuals with inferior traits are simply outcompeted by those with superior traits. And over time, you may find that a species is able to adapt to its local environment. We have some examples. We're familiar with some examples. Mosquitoes have developed resistance to pesticides. And the reason for that is that different mosquitoes have different degrees of sensitivity to the chemicals in the pesticides. And those mosquitoes that are very sensitive to the pesticide die quickly. And they only need a small dose of pesticide. Whereas those that are a little more resistant are more likely to hang on a little longer and will produce offspring that inherit the resistance to the pesticide. Even if it's only a small resistance, it will accumulate over generations as those mosquito individuals with better resistance find, other, find mates of other mosquitoes with better resistance. Their offspring will even be better yet at resisting the pesticide. And eventually, the time comes when the pesticide is of no use. And we have experienced this over and over again with pesticides on, on insects, with herbicides on uh, weeds to weed control, and with antibiotics in disease control. We know that that's what happens. Eventually, antibiotics lose their, ability, their, their effect, effect, effectiveness. And we've come to the point now where there are some disease-causing bacteria that we really don't have adequate antibiotics for because antibiotics have not been managed wisely. In fact, the greatest consumer of antibiotics is, in, from what I understand, is in the, the animal food, the food animal industry, cattle, pigs, chickens, and so on, where enormous quantities of antibiotics are used up in their food to try to keep the animals healthy. And as a result, they are making the bacteria healthy and resistant and that affects us all. Well, this is a repeat. Individuals with greater resistance multiply faster than those with lesser resistance, and finally there's nobody left except those that the pesticide doesn't bother, and they have now become resistant. Now, we have said that species can change, and they would form locally adapted populations, from a common ancestor. Is there any way that we might suggest how to identify species that have come from a common ancestor? Here is one way that I would propose. We have here a, a, a map of different species of bears. The bears belong to a family, and I think this represents all the species of bears that exist in the world today. Of course, there are some fossil species that are extinct, but these are the living bears. And we have in North America, the brown bear and the polar bear in the north. And in the mid region, you have what's called the American black bear. And in South America, the spectacled bear, I think it's called. 
And then in Eurasia, you have another species of bear. Then in uh, India, you have, I think it's the, uh, I've forgotten the names of some of these things. India, there's a species, and then in Southeast Asia, there's a species, and then of course, there's the panda bear. Those are the bears. The red lines, well, first of all, the diagram, the branching diagram is what you might call the evolutionary tree for bears. Scientists have studied these and they've said these are more closely related to each other than to other bears and so they form this family tree, if you please. And uh, you'll notice that the brown bear and the polar bear are close relatives in this family tree. And in fact, the red lines represent examples of hybridization. Polar bears and brown bears can cross and produce offspring. That's a, that's a very strong indication that they are genetically very similar. And so uh, that might be helpful in trying to estimate which species belong to a single lineage. If they can interbreed, probably they belong to the same lineage. So we would say, or I would say at least, brown bear, polar bear, American black bear, and European bear are probably all the same species. I'm sorry, all from the same lineage, probably all from the same create, separately created lineage. Now, the two Southern Asian bears are also able to hybridize. You'll see the red connecting them. There are no reported hybrids that I've heard of between this group of bears and this group of bears. There are no reported hybrids between this species and any of the other bears. And there are no reported hybrids between this species and the other bears. So how many different lineages might be represented here? Well, we could say at least uh, no more than one, two, three, four. There might be four lineages. On the other hand, since they are in different geographic regions, it may be that this group has been isolated from this group for so long that what used to be, they used to be able to interbreed, and, but they're no longer able to. So perhaps they should belong to the same lineage. And it might be that they all, all the bears are in one lineage. I don't know what the answer is, but we can at least study the question and develop some kind of theories or hypotheses as to how that might work. However, bears do not hybridize with any other kind of animal. So from this standpoint, we would not propose that bears evolved from something that wasn't a bear, but that one kind of bear was the original kind and has spread out across the world adapting to local conditions, forming different species in different regions, collectively forming a lineage with a separate ancestor from other such lineages. Now, how might species vary? Can we explain how it is that a, an animal could have a different shape from another animal of the, uh, by what we might call evolution or local adaptation? Well, the shape of an organism's body is produced during its development, its embryological development. So if we're going to change the shape of a body, we have to do something during development. Something has to happen during development to cause that shape. And one of the ways that has been proposed that that could happen is that during development, you have certain genes that begin their activity at different times in the developmental process. If you could change the timing of some of those genes, so that a gene that used to occur at 30 hours into development might, occur, might kick in at 32 hours, or you know, pick any number you want, but some changes in the timing, that would mean that the body might grow for a longer or shorter period of time before something else started to happen. And that could change the proportions. That changes in the relative timing of events in development is called heterochrony. And heterochrony provides then morphological variation based on genetic variation 
to be acted upon by natural selection. And I think heterochrony is probably an important factor in how changes have come about. Consider the dogs. We're familiar with dogs, and they make a very convenient example. In the development of a dog's skull, the first stage of those listed here, we have three stages that are listed. The first stage is like this. Then this portion begins to grow, and the intermediate stage would be like this. And finally, if it grows long enough, continues to grow, it, it has a different shape. This is a different shape of skull from this. And this is intermediate and different also. Now, the King Charles Spaniel has a shape of skull like this, whereas the English Bulldog has a skull shaped like this, and an Irish Wolfhound has a shape of a skull like this. In other words, differences in the breeds of dogs can be explained as the result of differences in the amount of time the skull continued to grow before growth stopped. It's interesting that in a cat development, you do not have much difference between early stages of development and late stages of development. It's pretty much the same shape of skull all the way through. And do you see breeds of cats with different shaped skulls? No. There isn't any variation, there isn't any, any variation in genetics that would produce different shaped skulls, at least not under normal conditions. Certainly something very unusual is, is possible to happen, but we don't see it at least. Another interesting mechanism of change is something that personally I haven't looked at very much. It's fairly new, it's called epigenetics. And the idea here is that genes being composed of segments of DNA can be activated or silenced by chemical changes of the on the, along the nucleotide change, chain. And there is a, a, a methyl group or a, a various chemical uh, organic uh, groups uh, of, uh, of atoms, such as methyl or acetyl, that can attach themselves to the DNA or to the nucleotides and uh, in a process that's called methylation. And when it does that, it seems that it silences it. So it's possible for a grandfather to have a particular trait, maybe a very conspicuous trait, but if the gene for that trait is methylated, then that gene is not going to function in the next generation. And in fact, it may not function in the next generation or even the next generation. At any time, however, if it is demethylated, the methyl group taken off, it can function again. So you can have a trait that skips generations. I read an interesting title describing this situation in uh, Nature, I think it was Nature magazine. Uh, and the, the article was entitled, Unto the Third and Fourth Generations. Now, if you're an English speaker, you recognize that as coming from the uh, Second Commandment visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generations. Uh, the writer, of, who I'm pretty sure was probably an atheist, was at least familiar with the scripture and had picked up that phrase and said, look, here is an actual genetic mechanism in which the sins of the fathers can be visited upon the children, genetically. Very interesting. And uh, in fact, I, the uh, title of one was The Sins of the Fathers, I think, too. But anyway, uh, an interesting feature. What has changed in the DNA in this process? There is no change in the DNA sequence. It is still the same sequence, the same information. The difference is that there have been chemical changes that have shut the gene down for some time, possibly permanently. I don't know. This is under research right now because it's something new and it has such interesting potential for
for helping us understand some mysteries in inheritance. Why is it that suddenly a trait that has not been seen for generations suddenly shows up in a family and it can happen? Summarize, new species are produced when populations lose their, their ability to interbreed. Genetic changes cause variation among individuals resulting, or perhaps not alone, but allowing natural selection of the individuals with better genes. Another point that ought to be thrown in here, and I, I, I had to shorten the talk to some extent to try to fit it in. It is well known that mutations occur and are usually harmful, at least to some extent. There are a few mutations that may be useful under specific conditions, such as in the presence of a pesticide, a certain mutation in mosquitoes might provide a benefit where without the pesticide it wouldn't help. But there are large numbers of mutations that are neither helpful nor harmful in any significant way. They are generally slightly harmful slightly deleterious is a term that's often used, near neutral. And, and Tim Standish mentioned something about that in the question and answer session this morning. When an individual arises with a beneficial mutation, such that this is a great idea for natural selection, this individual is going to be favored that individual carries not only that beneficial mutation, but he carries many more very small, uh, mutations of very small negative effect. Natural selection cannot distinguish between very small effects. Natural selection only can, can operate when the effect is big enough to make a difference that's, that's statistically significant. So every, if you were to trace, if you were to trace the, the lineage of beneficial mutations, the pathway of accumulation of beneficial mutations, suppose for every good mutation, you got 10 bad ones. Now we think the number is much greater than that. It may be 100 or even 200, but let's just say 10. That means the first beneficial mutation that comes comes with a cost of 10 slightly bad mutations. The second one now adds another 10, and the third one adds another 10. Can you see what's going to happen? By the time you reach some threshold, maybe it's 50 negative mutations, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 1,000, but sometime in the future, those little tiny mistakes, those little tiny problems are going to add up so that this individual which has been blessed by a heritage of accumulating beneficial mutations finally reaches some level, it's going to wipe him out. That's the, the idea of error catastrophe or uh, genetic, uh, genetic uh, death. And so this, this computation has resulted in many scientists becoming convinced that Darwinian theory is not, is not going to work. There's, if evolution is true, it isn't because of Darwin's theory. There's something else that needs to be discovered or imagined to try to rescue evolutionary theory. Okay, now let's move to a creationist theory of change. First of all, the first thing we would put into this is that at creation there were many different kinds. There were polyphyletic. Uh, living diversity is polyphyletic. And in the Hebrew, the word for create is bara. Now, there's also other words like asa, but I'm thinking particularly of bara. And the word for kinds, different kinds of organisms, is min. So, some decades ago, an Adventist scholar said, I want to talk about this concept of a created lineage, and I will combine the word bara and min and make the word baramin. 
And so now other creationists have kind of picked this term up. So now you sometimes see creationists talk about, do these species belong to the same Brahman or to separate Brahmins? And that's a kind of a term that creationists sometimes use. But each separately created kind had the potential to diversify morphologically and adapt to environmental changes in local adaptation. And each created kind could potentially produce new varieties and species forming a Brahmin or created lineage. Now, let's also put into our creation theory something that has to do with the origin of life. In evolutionary theory, there is no God to create life, so we have to, they have to think of it in terms of some chemical evolution, as they call it. But in biblical creation, we do not need to, we do not need to resort to that kind of explanation. God creates life. Life comes from a creator. And there is overwhelming scientific support for that. When one looks at the simplest form of life, the living cell, which is basically a, an interacting network of molecular machines, each of which is exquisitely designed with specific shapes and chemical properties to interact in useful ways with other such molecular machines and convert energy and raw materials into parts of the living cell. Extremely complicated and very sensitive to errors. And so I think in terms of the origin of life, uh, we, we don't have to struggle too hard to put that into our theory. Living organisms, l materials that are living, are easily converted to non-living materials. Death happens all the time. But there is no example where non-living materials are transformed into living materials unless there's already some living organism present to manage the process. You know, a plant does, in fact, bring non-living materials in and convert them into living materials. But there's a living plant there already. We do not see new life forming spontaneously out of the soil or the water. In creation theory, the what we might call morphological novelties are created and are not evolved. And what we mean by morphological novelties are unique morphological structures. For example, echinoderms have a specific kind of network of tube feet, a radial uh, water system and so on that are not present in mollusks. Mollusks, on the other hand, have a different kind of body shape with different kinds of organs that are not, some of them are not present in echinoderms. And likewise, for all the phyla, and to some extent, a lesser extent, but still significant in the classes, thinking uh, taxonomically. We do not, in creation theory, we do not attempt to explain how these things arose without God because we are quite comfortable with the idea that God created them. God created a diversity from the beginning. We do not need to try to figure out how that could happen otherwise because we don't think it did happen otherwise. Apparently, when God created living organisms, he gave them a genetic system that was itself designed to produce some changes that allow local adaptation. Here is a series of photographs of different kinds of pine trees. And I know you have lots of pine trees in Portugal and other parts of Europe, lots of them. Well, in California particularly, we have mountains in which different species of pine trees occupy different elevations. And in fact, someone who's knowledgeable can be blindfolded and put into the Sierra Nevadas. And if you can see and identify the pine trees where you are, you will have an idea of about what elevation you are at what, and uh, what you might expect to find in terms of climate and other species of plants and animals. They're that significant ecologically. But notice we have the digger pine here, which you find in the lower foothills that are hot and dry, often in association with oak trees. 
A little higher in the elevation, in elevation, we have the ponderosa pine, which is a large pine tree, usually in a, in a, a little bit of more moisture and a, a slightly higher elevation, but mid elevation. You go a little, just a little higher and a little more moisture and you have the sugar pine. If you go further away from the moisture and a little, little drier climate, you find a pine tree that's very similar to the ponderosa pine, but it's a little different. It's called the Jeffrey pine. And finally, in the higher elevations than the sugar pine, you'll, and sometimes overlapping, but slightly different habitats, you'll find the western white pine. And when you go farther in the mountains, you will find lodgepole pine and uh, white bark pine and other kinds of pines that mark different elevations and habitats. Now, it seems unlikely that God created all the pine trees in these different elevations. It seems to me eminently reasonable that God provided the original pine trees that he created with the ability to adapt to local habitats. Some of them can develop the ability to live where it's hot and dry. Others, where the growing season is very short, it's cold most of the winter with snow on the ground, but during that short growing season, the white bark and bristle cone and foxtail pines can, can survive and live. And in between, you have some pines that love the rich moisture and the lovely habitat that, where people love to go camping in the mountains. Um, and, and you get different species in different places. And this, I think, reflects the fact that there must be some designed system that God put into living organisms to enable them to spread out and fill the earth. Another part of creation theory is that there have been changes due to sin. Some changes, such as in the pine trees, I, I don't see those as the result of sin. They're the result of intelligent design and wonderful provision for species to adapt and fill the earth. But some have come about through sin. The specific one, is, some are mentioned in, uh, in Genesis, but there are some others that we could, I think, propose are likely to be that way. We have a picture of a, of a rattlesnake here, a very uh, kind of viper, deadly kind of thing. Um, there's a, certainly evidence of a curse in that, and perhaps even worse, elephantiasis. I'm sure you've seen pictures of elephantiasis uh, caused by a little worm that gets in the body fluids and blocks uh, vessels and so on and causes the leg to swell. And the crocodile, which is notorious for its uh, vicious predation. In the fossil record, there is a crocodile 40 feet long. I don't know if it's 40 feet to that wall or just what. But if you could imagine a crocodile that long, you'd say, you know, I, I don't see that as part of the Garden of Eden. Doesn't look like that to me. Been tremendous changes in species. Filling the earth requires change. And so we have talked about dispersal, natural selection, speciation, producing lineages or Brahmins. Here is yet another example. Here are four species of little sparrows. One of them, I think it's this one, is the, which one is it now? The, the, the Spanish sparrow. I think it might be this one. Anyway, here's the tree sparrow, and there's, there's a house sparrow, and there's uh, various sparrows. They're a little bit different from each other, different species in different areas. And I'm sure you, have, you are familiar with many of those anyway. Now, in our creation theory, we would like to, to think there might be some way of identifying what belongs to a similar Brahmin. And uh, here's another example. I gave you already the bears. Here's another example, the camels. Here's a map of camel uh, of the world. In South America, there are a few species, uh, have guanacos and, and yamas. There are also vicuñas and alpacas, but I didn't picture those. In North America, there's lots of extinct fossil camels, but none living uh, native. But in uh, Arabia, you have the Arabian camel or dromedary. And over here, we have the Bactrian camel. 
In Australia, you have camels, but they've been, they were introduced only a hundred and some years ago, so they're not native by any means, but there's lots of them apparently. Um, but notice the red lines represent the same thing. Hybrids can be made, either naturally or artificially. Notice that all groups of camels can interbreed. These interbreed freely. These interbreed freely. These two groups do not naturally interbreed, but someone was able to produce a hybrid artificially. So it seems reasonable when you see a group that represents the world in dispersal and can exchange genes, very likely they came from a single pair of camels on the ark. Here are some other examples of interesting hybrids. A zorse has a horse for a father. I'm sorry, a zebra for a father. The father's name is first. A zebra for a father and a horse for a mother. And zedonk, zebra for a father, donkey for a mother. Mules, of course, are familiar to us. But mules are not the only possible combination in this particular family of uh, equids, or horses, zebras, and donkeys. In the cat family, there are also hybrids. This is a liger, lion crossed with tiger. This is a lepjag, leopard crossed with jaguar. This one I had a hard time even believing, but apparently someone was able to cross a North American mountain lion with an Afro-Asian leopard. Uh, I won't, I've not, I won't, that's, this is a stuffed specimen that's in the, in the UK, museum at Tring, wherever, I'm not sure where that is. But anyway, uh, some interesting hints that perhaps the species in different areas that are similar may actually be just local representatives of a lineage that originally dispersed from the ark and across the land. Now we run into some interesting questions when we look at this. Uh, in some examples, there are large numbers of species that are similar found in a particular restricted geographic region. And I'm, let's take a look at, for example, the eucalypts of Australia. Uh, the number of different species of eucalyptus in Australia is something around 400, I think. 400 species. The number of wattles, now a wattle is an Australian word for acacias. There are something like 600 species of this kind of tree in Australia. The elapid snakes include uh, the majority of snakes in Australia and, most, and they're poisonous. And there's quite a number of them, certainly not hundreds, but probably, I don't know exactly, maybe 30 or some number like that. Kangaroos. And then in Madagascar, you have the lemurs that are not found anywhere else. Is it possible for that much diversity to arise in a fairly short time? And that's a question that's an, of interest to us. Oh, here's another example of what may be a, a created ancestor, uh, a lineage from a created ancestor. Now, if these were all found in one geographic region, it would be pretty impressive. In this case, the dogs happen to be very easily, very mobile, and they're able to disperse, and so they're found all around the world and not just in a single place. But uh, there are some, some groups that are found uh, in a single place, and we'll come back to that. In, in creation theory, we have the expectation that change cannot just occur on and on indefinitely, but there, there are... Uh, limits. The genetic system that allows local adaptation does not allow transformation into a different type of organism. New inventions we might call innovations. And in living organisms, innovations probably are not evolved but are created. And as innovations, I, I just illustrate with you know, the, the wheeled cart a carriage, the airplane, a sculpture that someone has created. These are not the kinds of things that just kind of evolve. They are created. And then, so, wh when we see these differences, we would suspect separate ancestries. See, we looked at some hints that might give us similar ancestry. Now, on the other side, we would like to look for any ideas on how we might identify separate ancestry. 
and different innovations would be one, different body plans, and different genes. I found it very interesting that just in the last several months, I believe, or perhaps a year, the Human ENCODE project studied the human genome and discovered, in comparison with the, hu the chimpanzee genome, that in humans, there are somewhere near 200 genes that are not found in the apes at all. 200 genes found in humans, but not any other animal. Where did they come from? In other words, if chimpanzees or similar to, uh, apes similar to that are actually ancestral to humans, we would expect humans to have the same genes as the chimpanzees, only modified a little bit. But 200, I mean, if it was just one gene, that would still be an interesting point. But 200 genes is like, there's something going on here. It's not evolution. This, in my opinion, is a, is a good argument that humans were not developed from chimpanzees, but in fact are separately created. Even though there are very many similarities, look at the differences. We've never seen a chimpanzee build a space shuttle or anything like that. It's a tremendous difference between humans and other organisms. Here are some examples of different body plans. We've already mentioned something about that. Another hint that might suggest separate ancestries is differences in the way an embryo develops. Because remember, the body is formed and structured during development. So if the process of development is different, very likely you're gonna come out with a different kind of body. So if you consider the classes of vertebrates, such as fish, frogs, turtles, birds, and humans, and look at how they start out in life as a fertilized egg, then developing in through some early uh, stages of division, cell division, and then a little further along, look at the comparison. A little later, here's how they compare. A little later, they compare like this. Do those processes look the same? No, they're quite different. And they come out with different products in the end. So since we see that, it's a fairly interesting and natural conclusion that probably they are created separately. They are separately created uh, groups. So in the end, instead of as an evolutionary picture of a single evolutionary tree with all the branches connected to the same root, a creationist would see, yes, there are changes in species. There are even family trees of species in which there is branching. But there are many, many, many such trees, and they are small, not big like the evolutionary tree. So we have a creationist forest, perhaps, a creationist forest of little trees, or if you prefer, a creationist orchard. The idea of an orchard, of course, implies an intelligent plan in the diversity. I will just go real rapidly through here. We'll talk about, is there time to produce hundreds of species? Let's suppose it takes a thousand years to produce a species. And we do see changes in species within just a few years. It depends on, what we, on how the speciation occurs. If you think of speciation as coming one at a time, it would take a very long time to produce the 300 species of hummingbirds. If you would regard speciation as occurring like this, where it divides into two in each successive generation, two new species, you could get 300 species in 1,000 years, in 9,000 years, if each speciation took 1,000 years. On the other hand, if one species came out of the ark and dispersed across the earth, and then each local population developed into its own species, you could get any number of species in just 1,000 years. So it depends on the process as to how long it takes. Thank you very much for your time and attention. May God bless each one of you.